Hi, and welcome to the Diocese of Camden Easter Retreat. Tonight is Acts of Fire, and I am Donna Ottaviano Britt, and I head up the Office of Discipleship and Leadership for the Diocese, and I'm also the host of Joyful Disciples on the Talking Catholic YouTube channel. And I am excited. This is our second night of Acts of Fire and exploring the Acts of the Apostles. These are the early Christians. These are the apostles to whom Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. And they did exactly that. And there's a great deal that we can learn from them. And so we're going to explore the Acts of the Apostles tonight. So last week when we were here, we talked about the reading from the Acts of the Apostles yesterday. And what we're going to talk about tonight is the reading that comes next week. But I want to share with you a little bit around what we heard yesterday. And it really laid out what we believe as Catholics. So if you look at that reading, it talks about what we believe. So the apostles teaching, it talks about the breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharist, which we believe. It also talks about their fellowship and community and the importance of prayer in their lives. So it's really exciting to spend time with the early first century Christians for us to learn how to be like them here in the 21st century. So I want to share with you that you can ask questions, whatever platform you're watching this on, if it's on Facebook Live, if it's on the uh, Diocese of Camden YouTube channel, wherever you are, please feel free to ask questions. We'll be taking them later in our retreat tonight. And then I want to take an opportunity now to introduce you to our retreat leaders, and they do have a special guest. So I want to introduce you to Deacon Peter Gallagher, who is stationed here at Holy Family Parish in Sewell, and he'll be ordained later this year, so we should keep them all in prayer. And then we have Dan Palmieri, who teaches at Holy Cross, but is also a founding member of JMJ Missions. And their special guest is Lori Power tonight, who is actually the di director of evangelization and discipleship at Christ the Redeemer in ATCO. And you don't get to escape, Lori, because last <laughs> week I asked some questions uh, of Dan and Deacon Peter so that those of us who are participating in the retreat, we get to know you better. Okay. And so we thought, <laughs> actually I thought, if, if they had requested you to come and join them tonight for this night of their retreat, there must be a friendship here. So could you share a little bit about what it's like to be friends with Deacon Peter <laughs> and Dan Palmieri? <laughs> Well, Donna, I have to say, um, I had an acquaintance once that I used to do um, some street evangelization with, and he was going to bring another friend along, and he said, oh, um, you'll really like him. He loves Jesus, and that's all he told me, and I said, well, that's really all I need to know. Like, that's the best compliment you can give someone, so I can say with confidence that Deacon Peter Gallagher and Dan Palmieri, they love Jesus, so whatever they're doing for Jesus, like, I'm happy to be on board, so this should be great. That's great. <laughs> So now that we have all the introductions underway, we know what we're going to explore tonight because the Acts of the Apostles is chock full of love for Jesus yes. and for uh, very good examples for how we should live as his disciples in the 21st. So I will turn it over to all of you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. We wanted to first, before uh, we dig in, we wanted to kind of talk about uh, context like we did last week. And I'm happy to have... Lori here, especially because, believe it or not, Lori is studying as well. She's studying to be a great, knowledgeable <laughs> theologian. So she has some really good insights that we're happy to share along with Dan and I. But Dan, do you want to start us off with prayer before we, we get started? Last week we, we forgot. This <laughs> week we wanted to start with prayer. Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing us all here tonight. For everyone joining virtually, we thank you for their presence as well, for tuning in. We ask you to please give the Holy Spirit the gift of that Spirit to us, even though we're not worthy, uh, that we can speak with your truth and your love in our hearts. And we pray that everyone who is listening, that their hearts may be opened as well, so they can receive your truth and your love into their hearts. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, through the intercession of the apostles. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Lori, we, we need a little bit of background. We need some background to <laughs> this one. Background. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. So you touched on it a little bit last week that really Pentecost is the background yeah. for what we're going to we're going to experience in the Acts of the Apostles. And um, so we know that Peter and the Apostles were gathered in the upper room 
um, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and all of a sudden, those who they were, you know, fearful and um, afraid for their lives, even to go out and talk about Jesus. Now they're out and they're talking, and um, there is a large group of Jews gathered in Jerusalem at this time from um, nations outside of Judea, and they're out there. They're preaching and. People are listening to them and saying, they're speaking Aramaic. That's not our <laughs> native language. How do we understand what they're saying? Yeah. So uh, Peter steps in, and he's going to explain like what's going on here. So it's interesting how people respond to this event. So some people, everybody's in awe, obviously, but some people are a little skeptical, like, mm -hmm going on here others are saying oh you know could this be god is this a supernatural <laughs> event and then the others are saying oh well they must be drunk <laughs> so peter gets up and says uh no these men are clearly not drunk it's nine o'clock in the morning they they're not <laughs> drinking but let me explain what's actually happening here so what we're going to read today is actually peter's sermon to the to the people who were um outside that upper room mm -hmm. and we don't actually get to hear the first half of it but it's beautifully set up. So you um, mm -hmm. touched on the fact that clearly this is the Holy Spirit because Peter was a fisherman. He was yeah. not a rabbi. He was not someone trained in rhetoric, yet he delivered a beautifully crafted sermon here. And he starts out by saying, so they're not drunk, but let me tell you what's going on. <laughs> um, <laughs> you all know the prophecy of Joel that he said in the day of the Lord, um, God will pour out his Holy Spirit on mm -hmm. all of you, on your sons and daughters. They will prophesy. They will um, dream dreams and have visions. And those who, they will perform mighty deeds. And those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he's setting it up. Okay, you know this prophecy. Now, where we jump in is where, how Jesus is going to fulfill the prophecy of Joel. So yeah. he set it up beautifully to really draw people in. Thank you, Lori. I think it's helpful to just, yeah, we're in the context of preaching. We're in the context. I think we were, we were kind of chatting before when we were setting up for this. Like, uh, can you imagine this in downtown Hanfield? <laughs> can, or like, or even like, let's make it bigger. Like, how about um, Citizens Bank Park? <laughs> or like Lincoln Financial Field? Uh, Peter has this stage, and he's just speaking and preaching the word. And so can we imagine ourselves listening to Peter, who's the main character today, offering this homily, which strikes the hearts of the listeners. I think really just priding, trying to put ourselves in the situation and really um, listening. And listening is actually what we're going to see is kind of one of the main words that pops out. So, And I think it's actually pretty amazing, Deacon Peter, what you, what you said um, and what you guys hinted at, which is that, you know, this stage is really set here. I mean, beforehand you hear about Pentecost. Yeah, this is the day of Pentecost. It is the biggest day in the church. You know, it was the birthday of the church, unofficially, mm -hmm. right? And so it might even be official, I think unofficially, birthday <laughs> of the church, right? So, I mean, you're, people are very excited to hear what Peter has to say, or at least we should be, because right before this, what happens? Well, tongues as of fire show, uh, you know, appearing over their heads, right? Um, they, Peter kind of gives up and gives that pep talk beforehand. I mean, I mean, it's very important to really dive into and, and to try to figure out what he's going to say here because this is kind of like the central theme of Christianity that he's going to mm -hmm. get at in the text we're about to read. He has one shot to get out there mm -hmm. and really preach with the Holy Spirit, you know, in his heart with God behind his back to kind of explain to people, okay, we were all just in hiding. Now we're not. Mm -hmm. We were all just scared literally for our lives. Romans hunting us down, right? Um, the, Roman, the, the, the soldiers, it's illegal. The Pharisees hunting us down, the, the Sanhedrin, and now we're not. So here's what I have to say to you, because something obviously changed in their hearts for them to go out there and speak so boldly the way they do. Yeah, Dan, you were just hitting on that. We heard it yesterday in the gospel, how Jesus came into the locked room. The people are afraid. The funny part, I think it's great, and it's, it's very realistic. Uh, Jesus came to the eleven and, you know, ordained them priests and, you know, like, told them, peace be with you. But one week later, they're in the same place. They haven't moved. They're still afraid. <laughs> like, it takes a, little, takes a little time to get them, get them going. So now they've gotten through this. Um, they've made a decisive move because of Pentecost, because of the Holy Spirit. But 
I think we should. I think we should read the text before yeah, we're, we're giving it. everyone building it up. In, we're building bunch, it up. So. <laughs> Dan, do you want to lead us? Sure, sure. So, uh, as same thing as last week, this is the New American Bible. Uh, this is the closest to the version you'd hear at Mass. This is Acts chapter two, verses fourteen. Well, it starts off with verse fourteen, and then it jumps to verses to verse twenty-two until thirty-three. So it's Acts two, chapter two, verse fourteen, then verses twenty-two to thirty-three. Let's dig in. Okay, the Peter speech at Pentecost. It says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, You who are Jews, indeed all of you staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to my words. You who are Israelites, hear these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs, which God worked through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This man, delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed, using lawless men to crucify him. But God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death, because it was impossible for him to be held by it. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand I shall not be disturbed. Therefore my heart has been glad and my tongue has exulted. My flesh too will dwell in hope because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. My brothers, one can confidently say to you about the patriarch David that he died and was buried, and his tomb is in our midst to this day. But since he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that neither was he abandoned to the netherworld, nor did his, did his flesh see corruption. God raised this Jesus, of this we are all witnesses. Exalted at the right hand of God, he received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father and poured it forth, as you both see and hear. One more time. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definitive plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope. For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let the Holy One see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, and thou wilt Make me full of gladness with thy presence. Brethren, I may say to you confidently of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus raised up, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Holy Spirit, from the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. Okay. Now, is there, um, before we begin, is there a certain word or phrase that, uh, really strikes you when you read this, Dan and Lori? So one thing that I can say jumped out to me um, was at one point, it sounds, you know, you run into Christians sometimes or Catholics or sometimes lapsed Catholics uh, that are, have fallen away from the faith. And sometimes you get the impression that maybe, maybe they are a little um, discouraged or they feel kind of like um, accused or you know like I, th I think I made a reference last week like how sometimes 
maybe because of our sins or if we've been away from the church for long enough, you think if you walk into church, you're going to melt or like get zapped or, 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 you know, or that, you know, God's going to strike you down with a thunderbolt. Very, very, um, you know, a, a discouraging way to look at things. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage anybody that might be watching, um, and anybody that might be joining us virtually, that that should never, ever, ever uh, hold you back from, from the church and hold you back from God. Discouragement is, does not come from the mm -hmm. Lord. And I think this, this uh, and the reason I'm saying all this is because um, <laughs> this passage, part of it could seem very accusatory, accusative. All right. Uh, Peter, right here, it says, he, he's, as he, in the middle of his speech, he says, the one thing that stuck out to me, he says, this man delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed using lawless men to crucify him. Like he literally looks at the, the Jewish people who are standing there and he literally says to them, you killed them, <laughs> or you killed him. You, like, paraphrasing here, but like, you just killed God. That's pretty much what Peter says to him. Um, and that can seem really like, you know, oh, like, look what you did. You know, you're, you're horrible, you're awful. But if you keep reading, and this is why context is so important, actually the passage has nothing to do with that. Uh, if you keep going, you realize that Peter actually doesn't sound upset about this at all. He, he, he said, you killed him, but the next passage is, but God raised him up, releasing him from the throes. Of, like, he's excited about it. He's like, you killed him, but like, hey, that was like supposed to happen. Like, this is all predicted, and, uh, and he didn't actually die. So like, good, good for us, right? It's a really, really positive message. And if you keep going, you see them say, uh, you see their reaction. It's not part of the passage that's spoken of in Mass, but immediately after this passage, the people didn't say, oh my gosh, she just accused me of killing God. Their reaction is, oh, okay, cool, great. Like, what do I do to get involved here? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, their reaction is, oh my gosh, <laughs> we killed God. It's like, what do we, you know, kind of yeah. what, we, what we hit on last week. What do we do now? Mm -hmm. So actually, they do not feel accused at all because the grace of Christ, when you know that he's beaten death and overcome everything, everything that could, you know, that could possibly, whether it's, you know, sins of yours or just anxieties, discouragement, when you know he's overcome those things, you're not filled with discouragement anymore. Yeah. You're not filled with a self, you know, like I'm, I'm horrible, I'm going to hell. You don't think like that at all. You're, you're filled with joy. And you see genuine joy in these yeah. people that were just accused of killing God. So um, pretty amazing there. Um, I don't know if any Dan, of you had the similar that was thoughts. That was like quite the word or phrase. <laughs> that was like, I'm like, like, I'm like trying to count that many. That was a lot of words, dude. You like, killed. I think the two words there, you, you killed. You okay. killed him. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> Got to pick two of them. <laughs> Lori, Lori right. you can go. So yeah, the words that stood out to me came right before that, actually. Um, okay. The set plan and foreknowledge of God. Hmm. Like that was amazing to think about that God knew this was going to happen. This was part of his plan. And I think a lot of times we ask ourselves, like, why do bad things happen? I mean, in the middle of the situation we're in right now, why mm -hmm. is this happening? You know, why are we in the middle of a pandemic? Um, and I think we have to remember that God has a plan. He loves us and he will not do anything to harm us. And if he allows evil, it's only so he can pull a greater good from it. Hmm. Um, so we see on the cross, all the sin of all time was hurled at Jesus on the cross and God pulled from that the redemption of mankind. Hmm. So even in the worst possible situations, God can pull good from it. So that's really what resonated with me. He's about to you know, accuse them, you killed yeah. God, but look what what happened after that? You know, it's <laughs> it's for our benefit. So that was that was what resonated with me. Wow. Yeah, I I um, I'm glad we all picked different words. The word, we the word that in advance. <laughs> no, we didn't. We did not. Uh, the word that speaks to me is witnesses, and um, I think one of the beautiful parts about the gospel is it's a gift, mm -hmm. and not just the gospel, but we're reading Acts now, so. The whole, all the scriptures, they're a gift. Christ's salvation for us is a gift. And so um, it has to be received. And there's something about uh, witnesses that it's more than just like passive. There's something of the, the apostles and those who are listening, who, as it says, like Dan was saying, um, they were struck to the heart. They were cut to the heart is what this says. And they became witnesses alongside of these first witnesses alongside the apostles who were there for both the death and the resurrection and and Pentecost and so 
we are witnesses and we today believe those witnesses then or else we wouldn't be here so that's that was like the first word that that spoke out spoke to me yeah i think i just read something that someone was convinced about the truth of the resurrection because mm. Um, you know, these people couldn't, the apostles couldn't keep this story up. If it was a lie, if it wasn't true, they would not have gone to their desk. Clearly they saw something that impacted them and changed their lives. So yes, true witnesses. And uh, that reminds me of the movie, The Case for Christ. If anyone's yes. ever seen that movie, mm -hmm. highly Excellent recommended. Um, mm. and, and good acting too. Uh, a very, very highly recommended video. I showed it to my students. They loved it. It goes through all of the the logical reasons why the resurrection hmm. really happened and how we have a lot of evidence of that one of the biggest ones being that you don't you don't give your life up for a like a dead guy <laughs> like why would anybody why would anybody do that um doesn't make any sense but i would even say not only do they think he's risen but people must have felt him in what the apostles said and mm -hmm. taught you don't give your life up for someone who died and not only that you certainly don't give your life up for someone who's going to speak to you and you're just going to feel dry in their words. Do you feel like they don't care about what they're saying? Sure. Um, I think it speaks to us as Christians, as, as, as Catholics today in 2020, in a world that really needs it, that we need to have courage like Peter mm -hmm. to speak what's on our heart, speak what's on our mind um, in the most loving, gentle, and humble way possible. Of course, knowing that, as you said, it is a gift mm -hmm. because you know when, when we talk about the Lord to our friends, to our peers, coworkers, families, it's not about us and it's not because we've done anything special, it's because it's been given to us purely as a gift from God. Yeah. And it's meant for everybody. Hmm. And that, yeah, you can't keep to yourselves as the apostles couldn't before they, before they, all of them, except I believe St. John, right? Yes. Gave up their lives. So, and I believe they tried, they yes. tried to kill John. <laughs> they, they tried, tried to, to kill John, John. they couldn't kill him. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you know what I was just thinking, Dan? Well, one, I have a question. Do you know if it was based on a book, The Case for Christ? It's yes. Okay. We, mm -hmm. do you remember reading that? I think I read it with Dr. Morrow a long time ago, maybe my first year of college seminary that uh, we read that. And I remember I was very struck by it. So I just have to watch the movie now. The fun part. That was excellent. Yeah. Okay. Everyone yeah. go watch the movie. <laughs> right. During the Easter season. Yes. Lee Strobel, the author, he mm -hmm. later went on. Yes. He was an atheist and then became a pastor, a Christian pastor. So. Wow. And mm -hmm. so did, I think, at least one of his children. Incredible mm. story. The other thing I was thinking of, Dan, you just said something about the, um, I guess what I'm, what I'm going for is the, it's, you can't just give your life for a dead man. You can't just, um, like, where is the, where is the inspiration coming from? And back to what you were, we, we were saying before about like, how could Peter and John, who we see later, do this later, like earlier this week, which is, um, in Acts chapter three, we hear about Peter and John, the people around them saying, there's no way this comes from anyone but God. They're uneducated men. And it was clear and powerful. And, um, but the other thing is, uh, they're, so they're speaking, they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it um, matches up with something reasonable. Like they are acting like good rhetoricians or powerful, but it's reasonable. They're just doing something that they were never trained to do by the Spirit's power. And I think that's important to say that our faith is not, um, or even the Holy Spirit works in not this like strange new way. It's not like um, the people are transformed or changed, not by human language or not by, it's, they're struck by these words that Peter just like is totally out of his league to be able to <laughs> offer. And he's, be, he's, being, he's able to give it by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of interesting. That yeah, strikes me. You know, it, it, it's amazing because you can't put our faith into a box. There's no formula. There's no, there's no trick to salvation. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it, our faith, we've had some great preachers throughout the, the centuries, but it doesn't usually boil down to like just rhetoric itself or like being good at speaking. You can be really good at speaking, but it might have nothing to do with God and no good might come from, uh, might, you know, um, no good damage, I should say, may be done in someone's heart, you sure. know, um, through your words, if it's if it's not fueled by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think what you see with the apostles is pure love. It's just come, it's just pouring out of them. I mean, not only are they speaking, but they back up their claims later on with not only miracles, mm -hmm. but service of the poor, 
that family, the, the readings we had yet, uh, last week, the family togetherness, people just wanted to be around them. I think when someone speaks with the Holy Spirit, they speak with fire, they speak with passion, they speak with love, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, all, you know, use big words and seem educated or seem, you know, like you really know what you're talking about. I think if you just speak in the way you know how, mm -hmm. with, you know, the Holy Spirit behind you through prayer and you're speaking from the heart, he will touch souls. And that's something that anybody can do. Anybody. It could be someone, you know, uh, in your profession, in your home. Anybody could do this. That's the beautiful thing about our faith. Hmm. Let's talk about preaching. This was a homily, okay? So um, I was, I'm, I'm going to not do it. I was going to put Dan and Lori on the spot and ask them to reveal their favorite <laughs> diocesan preacher. I think that's dangerous ground. I think we're going to, I think we're going to like skip over that. But I do want to ask like, um, when it comes to homilies or preaching, is, is there something that like, so I, I ask this because it's helpful in the context of this homily that we're reading. Is there something that helps you receive the message? Like a style or even just, maybe you can think of someone that you really like and how would they preach? Um, so I would say, I would, when, when you, we were talking a little bit before this about preaching, and I, of course, thought of St. Dominic, the Excellent. founder of the Order of Preachers. Mm -hmm. And I think if you were to ask St. Dominic why they were so effective as preachers, um, he would say two things, the witness of their life. Mm -hmm. So he founded a mendicant order that re they were living the vow of poverty. So uh, people witnessed that and knew they were not, you know, living like kings. They were yeah. very simple. Um, the second is whenever Dominican preachers went out to preach and traveled, they always traveled in pairs. And while one was preaching, the other was praying, hmm. typically the rosary. So they were calling on, you know, asking That's cool. the Blessed Mother to, yeah. yeah, to intercede for them and um, really to intercede, send the Holy Spirit so that they could preach with fire. Sure. Um, and I guess the homilies that really have touched me are generally the ones that begin with a question and like mm. a very pointed question. So one that came to mind for me was an Easter vigil um, mass years ago. Um, the priest started by saying, how many times have you thought about Jesus today? Mm. And this is, this is during the Triduum, it's Holy Saturday. Sure. Easter's tomorrow. I should be thinking about Jesus a lot, right? But no, I had, you know, gotten my oil changed and I was shopping for food for dinner and I was prepping <laughs> right, food right. and I had to say, no, I haven't really thought about Jesus very much today, <laughs> unfortunately. And that really, mm -hmm. you know, uh, touched my heart and made me really think about, wow, I need to be intentional about setting aside time for prayer. I need to be intentional about doing the things I do for Christ. So it seems to be like when, when you ask a really good question and something that's that can, you know, strike hearts like that is sure. very impactful. Dan, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so I think for me, when there's a lot of enthusiasm, hmm. you can kind of just tell when someone means what they're saying. Yeah. And that goes not just for homilies, but for any, any area of, of, of speech. Um, when someone speaks from the heart, you know, you can, you can feel it. You can feel it in what they say. Um, so I think when, when a priest gets up there, a, a deacon, uh, anybody when they're preaching, but of course, most especially at Mass, when, when they truly mean what they're saying, and yes, I think a lot of the times, um, Laurie brought up, um, I did not know that about the, the Dominicans going around one praying while the other speaks. It's a great idea because you can tell when somebody prays. I mean, even if you mean something, even if you believe in the Lord, mm -hmm. without prayer, like on the side to back that up by somebody else or most importantly yourself, you know, that fire can kind of, you could believe it, but that fire could die down a little bit, you sure. know? So I think you, when, when, when a priest or anyone that's preaching prays on their own, you can tell because they receive wisdom from the Holy Spirit and that enthusiasm will always be there. It'll mm -hmm. all, the Holy Spirit will always just show up because in the end, it's not a, it's a, it's a gift. It's a yeah. pure gift. And so, and so they might, you know, they might be going through a lot. I, I've seen, I've seen had, had priests that I knew who are friends of mine personally going through so much. Uh, and I, I'll talk to them, you know, and then they get up Sunday mass or daily mass. <laughs> and then there's, I mean, it's amazing, right? They're, they're not only the cracking jokes are in a great mood, but like they're <laughs> speaking with such a, a fire and you're like, that's not them. Mm -hmm. Not because they're bad or they're poor sinner no, or only that, no, it's not. It's, but it's a gift, right? Like you don't yeah. need to be feeling great and the Holy Spirit will still show up because it's not, it's not us. So I think enthusiasm and prayer. 
you can tell. That's great. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of, I think, the best definition of a preacher um, I've heard is a uh, preacher is someone who God has set on fire and the people come to watch him burn. That's pretty much <laughs> <Wow. laughs> with the Do fire of the Holy Spirit. Where have you heard We've that? Never heard that never. Yeah, I think sure. I have. I think I have. Okay. But wow, that's cool. I would love to know who because it's yeah, beautiful. <laughs> that's we'll great. Have to look that up. Someone Google that for us. <laughs> yeah. Comment, please. Yes. Thank you. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I was struck by one of my old professors who also order of preacher. So I'm trusting he, on preaching. He knows things. And he would always pray to the Holy Spirit and pray that the Holy Spirit was working in the listeners' hearts before we would preach. And it's kind of interesting because it's really just not, um, that's almost saying like, it's not me. It's actually very clearly saying it's not me. And that's right back to here, that who is this guy, Peter? How is he doing this? How, like this is, this is a fisherman. How is he able to convince people and, and people, 3,000 people bapt were baptized after this homily. That's incredible. That's the Holy Spirit working, though. That's not possible by human means. We've never, I've never heard of that. <laughs> I think what really highlights what you just said about, about it not being us or Peter being uneducated and still mm -hmm. able to move hundreds, if not thousands of hearts by his words, I keep thinking of that prayer. I think it's in the Miraculous Medal Novena. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, Lord who has chosen, he says something like the prayer says, I always found it very beautiful. You've chosen the weak things of the world mm -hmm. to like accomplish your greatest mm -hmm. plans. He does that on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Because in the end, if you think that you're anything, I mean, like, not that you should, you know, be discouraged or dislike yourself. But I mean, if you think that you, you're the one, like people's salvation depends on you. Yeah. Well, immediately it snuffs the Holy Spirit out because we can't yeah. really do that on our own. Peter no. can't do that on his fisherman's education and his you know, his fisherman's experience, right? Uh, but he chooses the weak things of the world because they're humble. Mm -hmm. And when you're humble, your heart is open and the Holy Spirit can flood. He, 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 he can flood in. Um, and you don't need that education. You just need a humble, open heart, willing to willing to speak what God wants you to speak. And it just goes. And, it, you know, you talked about Joel, uh, the mm -hmm. prophet Joel. You know, this is all predicted, you know, in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. um, saying that Pentecost was going to come hundreds of years before it did. And... Um, he did the same thing with Israel. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if it's Deuteronomy, Leviticus, one of those books. God goes out of his way and says to Israel when they're struggling, you really think that I picked you because you're all high and mighty? He goes, I picked <laughs> you because you're the tiniest and I kind of yeah. like have a thing for the underdog, right? <laughs> right. So like, you know, if you see yourself as the underdog and, and, and you know that the Lord's everything and that your sins are, you know, you're, when, you, when you sin, that's you. Yeah. When, when great things come through you, that's the Holy Spirit. When you're aware of that, good things can happen. I agree. So um, you kind of just hit on the Holy Spirit, or sorry, you hit on the Old Testament. And so in the second part, we see some David. We see some David name drops. So what's going on with the David and Jesus is the son of David? Um, why, why is Peter bringing that up? Okay, so David was king of Israel, mm -hmm. probably one of the greatest kings of Israel. Yeah. And everyone would have obviously known who David was. He even said, <laughs> uh, his tomb is right here. You know, they probably weren't far from it. Uh, if you've been to the Holy Land, it isn't, yeah. the upper room is yeah, not far right there. from the tomb of it's David. Um, so the prophecy was that David's line would continue forever. Mm -hmm. But then when Israel was conquered and, and it looked like, you know, the, the sons of the kings were killed, how is this going to happen? How is, gonna, how is God going to bring this to fulfillment? And Peter is telling them, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the <laughs> one who is the son of David who is going to fulfill this prophecy. And mm -hmm. the reason, there's a reason to be excited. That's why Peter, I think, is so excited in yeah. sharing this with everyone. It was my understanding, like, you know, David's the, their, their favorite king. And even just think back to your favorite memories of, you know, our glory days. Like, the glory days of the people of Israel are David, under David. And so now bring back the, this, these happy memories and the promised fulfillment. And Jesus, who's going further than David, because David was human, Jesus is God. I think it's amazing that you go back and David was like the icon, as you said, of like mm -hmm. greatness for, the, for the, uh, the nation of Israel. And Jesus just blows that wide open, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, we have, and actually you mentioned um, Israel falling apart. They had the 12 tribes. They, were, they had fallen apart shortly before this reading. 
uh, one of, uh, right before Jesus ascends to heaven, one of the apostles says, Lord, are you going to reunite the 12 tribes of Israel? Mm -hmm. And he pretty much says, hey, you know, just like stick to what you know. <laughs> he says, be humble. <laughs> you're not, the Father will let you know when you're supposed to know. For now, you're going to go out and you're going to do amazing spiritual things. You're going to be my witnesses. But I do believe that we, we hold, the church fathers held that the 12 tribes of Israel were, were reunited, but it wasn't in the way people expected. It's through the church. Mm -hmm. We are the 12 yes. tribes of Israel reunited. It's right here. It's right now. And Laura was hinting at that. So Yes, absolutely. Dan, you're reminding me, or, or I'm, I'm reminded of something from our, us talking about David and from the, um, if you remember, the, that boring genealogy of <laughs> Luke and Matthew and see, like, like, we're all like, why is this happening? And the people in the first century would have been enthusiastic about this. They would have looked back at their family history and been like, yep. But Dan, this, this is the memory. I was not present at this, but I think you were. Do you remember Rocco's interpretation teaching the genealogy? Do you remember that skit from the Acts oh group, which gosh. I know the Acts yes. group is watching right, right. now. <laughs> right, so maybe right, Carrie right. remembers this skit. Oh, I think it's no. one of the funniest skits I've ever seen. I, w I hope Rocco's watching right now. So <laughs> Dan, can you so... tell everyone about this? Yeah, so <laughs> anyone that's ever that wants to get involved with youth, minist youth ministry, I learned from my experiences at Our Lady of Peace uh, with Carrie and others that um, skits are a great way oh, to yeah. not only teach the Bible, but get people laughing uncontrollably uh, <laughs> and, uh, and really kind of softening up the atmosphere, the environment for the Holy Spirit to really come in. So we do skits every, every uh, or we did skits every year, and they probably still do for the, uh, the young retreats. adult retreats yeah. there. And... Um, one Rocco, who's the video editor for JMJ Missions, he uh, he did a genealogy skit in which he did a rap or a song. It was great, and it was probably the worst song ever written because it wasn't <laughs> a real song. He just made it up on the spot and did the genealogy of Jesus from everyone. So and so became the father of Joseph, Fat, who became the father of, and he's saying all mispronouncing all these names. But the whole point of that was that I believe it's Matthew that goes mm -hmm. to the genealogy, mm -hmm. right? He does that for a reason. He's not just trying to bore you out when you when you when you're hearing that you know that that verse um, that, that that passage read. Yeah. He's saying from Adam to David, there was a line that God formed to protect, to kind of keep sin away and, mm -hmm. and keep hope alive in the world. It goes through Noah up until King David, and then from King David to Jesus. Now, obviously, there's probably more more generations scientifically, uh, if you're look, talking to a historian, than than what Matthew said. But the point remains. Jesus is that Messiah promise foretold hundreds, if not thousands of years before he came. Mm -hmm. And the odds of him, I think Fulton Sheen said, the odds of Jesus fulfilling every prophecy that was, that was, <laughs> if he said, he said, if, let's say the odds of uh, Jesus fulfilling the prophecy of where he'd be born, Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Let's say the odds of him fulfilling that are one in a hundred. Obviously they're way higher than that. All right, and then you take, if you, you take 100 odds for all, I think, 400 and some prophecies of Jesus that the Jewish Pharisees had gathered together 2,000 years ago, mm -hmm. you would have to, he says, take a pencil, write a one, put a line under it. I think he said, write 84, and then 126 zeros afterwards. <laughs> Those are the odds that he would just come the way the Old Testament said he said That's come. crazy. So this is not a coincidence that we're here now at the church is what it is. Hmm. It's just not. So. <laughs> yeah. Foreknowledge plan of God. Yes. <laughs> we can see it. It's very ordered. Very and so organized. thank you, Rocco, for... Uh... Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was really important, yeah. Rocco, because otherwise <laughs> no one would find... That's not true. It would be difficult to, you know, really get into that. And so every time I hear that, I just think of you. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, one, this, there's one other thing that, um, I'm thinking of here, too, is... It says on, on verse 29, Brethren, I may say to you confidently. Um, the context is a little bit different, but what is there of preaching to with conviction? It kind of ties into the whole witness thing. I think there's a power when you look, you know what you, you, you look like you know what you're doing. <laughs> and um, I think that ties into humility as well and ties into entrusting yourself to the Holy Spirit because there is something like the Holy Spirit can act in a way that we cannot, like our human power isn't enough, but there's also uh, believing that the Holy Spirit 
can and will work through you and being confident in that. So it's not like, it's not like trusting yourself, but there's, there's a belief, there's a faith that I think Peter certainly had and the apostles had and the saints had that the Holy Spirit will work through them and that we can be confident in that and lean on it. Not, not puffing ourselves up, but leaning on Christ. Donna, I think you have some questions for us. You're this smiling. Was, this was the signal. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. I have some questions. She's down for the base, giving the, uh, giving down the, here. Yeah, giving the signal uh, to steal. And I also want to comment that Carrie Janice is like, no, I try to forget that memory of the script. <laughs> what? <laughs> she Carrie, says, no, she's favorite. just kidding. Okay, yeah. <laughs> she said it's a very funny memory, so it's a very funny story that you told. Um, but right, we find different ways to bring scripture to life. So I have a few questions, sort of several have come in, so I've kind of put them into a couple of different buckets. Okay. I'm curious uh, from some people who want to know, I want to share, I want to be like the apostles, but I do not feel at all equipped to do any of this. Mm -hmm. So where do I even think about beginning? So if one of you wanted to sort of take that on to start as a conversation starter. Sure. Well, this is something we were going to talk about a little bit later, but... Um, even it. just <clears throat> praying with and reading scripture and maybe inviting someone else to do that with you. Um, simple way to just talk about what God is saying to your heart and ask others to do the same. It's not rather unintimidating, I guess. <laughs> right, to study that way is yes. unintimidating. Yeah. I think some of our questions related to the how, so I'll read you this other question, right? So I've been baptized, I've been confirmed, but I don't really feel the Holy Spirit. So mm -hmm. how do I get the fire you all have? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Right? I have to pray a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think Donna too, I think, um, I wonder, especially, it's not exactly here in Acts, but I think that from some of Paul's writings, I don't think he thought every day was just, you know, great and dandy. I think of especially when St. Paul would talk about how he was a tent maker and he was laboring and he was at the same time preaching the gospel. So there was a fire that um, was provoking him on, but that didn't always mean he felt great. And so I think that that um, distinction is really important because we can't rely on feelings. Feelings come and go. I think that's especially um, clear in family relations whether it be marriage, whether it be brother, sister, mm -hmm. our relations with our parents, with especially like young relationships, I think that's huge. It's like, how do I, how do I love this person without, um, especially when I don't feel it, when I don't feel like doing X, Y, and Z. And I think um, part of really walking with someone and, and even the Bible studies, there's going to be a day everyone's tired. Mm -hmm. Everyone just, over, or uh, didn't sleep the <laughs> night before and um, it's the time of the coronavirus <laughs> what are we going to do and uh, we're going to still meet and have the Bible study we're going to go and we're going to push through and we're going to trust and I think um, so I think the important part is not feeling the fire mm -hmm. but it's living and believing the fire passes through us mm -hmm. and is inspiring us mm -hmm. And that's more important. If I can add something to that, it's yeah. a great point. Um, you're not always going to feel it because, as Peter said, Deacon Peter said, <laughs> faith, goes, <laughs> faith goes beyond feelings, right? Emotions are, you know, important. there's a lot of psych psych or psychiatry going on with this. You know, they're, they're, chem they're affected by chemicals in the brain. Now, to, to be sure, your soul and your emotions are connected, but they're not the same thing, mm -hmm. right? And so many times, if you're in that zone where, you know, like, I think last week we talked about coronavirus. Everyone's kind of just chilling. They're you know on Netflix. They're just sitting around. They don't know what to do. They're they're bored, and they it's hard to get out of that zone. Yeah. But when you make moves to actually force yourself to come out of that zone, mm -hmm. by reading scripture, you know, um, by praying the rosary, tuning into mass, um, you know, on online or going in person once this ends. I actually I would say and. Go get involved with, at your parish. Yeah. My conversion at, at, at 19 came through meeting people that were absolutely on fire. Mm -hmm. People from this diocese, people from a different country even, right? Yeah. Uh, some. So, like, 
if you get involved as much as you can at your church, you will meet some people that will kind of feed you that fire. You won't always feel it, but sometimes God will reward you, and you'll just know. Sure. You'll just know. I think that's a really good point, right, that this isn't all about feelings. We like the feelings. Yeah. We like the feelings of being on fire, but some days, right, it's not there. Like, I'm overextended. I have to be intentional right around the time that I will spend with Jesus. So I think that's really good lessons. And I also think, because I love Fulton Sheen, and you brought him up earlier, I actually yeah. think it was Fulton Sheen who said love is not a feeling it's actually a choice yeah. it is a choice that we make so if we make a choice make a choice in vocation make a choice in mission you know make a choice for jesus then some of that will w it will come for us right so for those who are looking to have the fire that you all are demonstrating tonight you know they want some of that so it's a really good um lesson here around these ways that you can do it mm -hmm. but to be with other people that are on fire because you want some of that. You're like, i got to get me some of that. How do I get some of that? <laughs> right. You know? Right. So that's really, that's really great. So a couple of questions came in, too, that are related to, in every century since mm -hmm. Jesus has been here, the church has had her struggles and her problems. So if you look at, at just even in the space of time in the last few years, even for us, mm -hmm. you know, kind of how do you, and it might be tied to what we just talked about is, because there, there, there comes a point for some people like, I'm just going to throw up my hands and be done here. You know, how am I supposed to live like the apostles and evangelize and do the teaching and do all of those things when it would appear the entire world is against me, but the world is. So what do you kind of do through these periods of time to sort of sustain, sure. you know, up against the things that, you know, we know are happening? Well, I would go back to what I know is true. So I know Jesus is the Messiah, as we saw today. I know um, I have a relationship with him. He founded this church, and he promised that it will be with us until the end of time and then beyond in heaven forever. So we have to go back to what we know. And even our own stories, There's, I'm sure mm. there's times where we have struggled and gone through really difficult experiences or loss or and God has been faithful to us and we know that that's true so even if maybe sometimes some people in the church are not faithful or people hurt us um, we know that God is faithful to us yeah on that point um, the question had something to do with the church having its struggles in every generation every century and um, also connected to what you said the the church has had struggles since it started. And that's not actually not a bad thing. People are always bashing on the church's history. That's actually a really, uh, really consoling thing that church has had struggles in its entire history because it's still here. <laughs> like, historically speaking, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be here. <laughs> it should have never made it through the Roman, it should have never made it past this part, right? Like, it should have never <laughs> made it. I mean, the Roman persecution, I mean, it's never had like a standing army. I mean, sure, you can talk about all the, the crusades and everything, but I mean, it should not, it, it should not be here. It still is because Jesus made a promise. And so you, mm -hmm. make, you make a commitment. Say to yourself, look, I'm convinced that Jesus started this church. I'm convinced in the love of what I'm reading in scripture. I'm convinced that when I pray the rosary, something good is happening in my soul. I'm convinced the church will never, will never be taken down. The coronavirus can't take it down. Here we are, right? So I'm going to keep going with this. This is who I am. This is my life. That's who I am. And, and, you know, and none of us are equipped. Don't, don't, don't let yourself get discouraged because no one's actually worthy to preach this. It's all a gift. Mm -hmm. So relax. Don't take yourself so seriously. And the Holy Spirit will take care of the rest. Donna, I learned a great lesson from my grandma just two weeks ago. I called her on the phone, and she said, Peter, Jesus said in the Bible, I'll be with you always, and I hold him to that. <laughs> Isn't that just so <laughs> consoling? That's what she said. She's, she's taking Jesus at her word, and I think there's something to that. It's like Jesus makes a lot of promises. I kind of was thinking about that Fulton Sheen like quote thing. Like I almost am curious, like the amount of promises Jesus makes but one of them is, I will be with you always. And one of them is to Peter, entrust in the church. And so as many sins are, as there are in every generation, there's also saints. Mm -hmm. I also think, I, I just read this yesterday from my class, very timely. Someone asked um, Pope Benedict XVI when he was a cardinal in the 80s. And there was like an like interview. And they're like, if you, he was, at the time, he was the head of the, Congregation of Doctrine of Faith. So he's in charge of catechizing, evangelizing in some ways. And um, they asked him, you know, if you were to leave this job, what would you do? 
He said, I'd go back to Germany and teach. And one of the things that just struck me was the reality of our human existence and even like original sin. Like how, and, and you're like, I'm like, Donna, you're like, why are you telling me this? Like, <laughs> what does this have to do with anything? I was the, the, reality, I'm just be the reality, like <laughs> how badly we need God. Mm-hmm. I think that's important of like, we are, we, we need God. And um, what I think, uh, if you can YouTube it, w- there's an amazing, um, when John Paul II went back to Poland, first time as Pope, I'm pretty sure it was his first time, during the communist revolution. And, you know, like they weren't really showing anything on um, the national t- TV because they just weren't, weren't huge fans of, you know, Catholicism. And uh, the people are chanting, we want God, we want God. And there's something like we need him. We, we, we really need him. And guess what happens when we invite him in? Good things happen. Like the church is good for the world. And if we can believe that, if we can believe God is good for the world and just live it one day at a time, we can really give, you know, pass on the fire to each other. And that really is our witness to other people mm-hmm. is how we live. Yeah. And we live the way we live because this is what Jesus taught us and this yeah. is what we believe. But if I ever needed anything else, then now that your grandmother is holding Jesus accountable, I think I'm good. I'm good. I'm good with that. So thank you very much. And I'll let you get back to sort of wrapping us up for the, you know, the last you know, 10 or so minutes of our retreat night. So thank you for taking the questions. Thank you, Don. So Laurie uh, was going to give us a little practical tips on how, uh, one way you can read scripture, just one kind of, um, we're calling them practical nuggets. Yeah. You can take home with you <laughs> after this uh, when it comes to scripture. So. Absolutely. So there's an ancient method of praying with scripture, but it's very simple. Um, it's called Lexio Divina, and it basically has four mm-hmm. parts. And we did sort of a modified Lexio tonight. Yeah. Um, so the first is the Lexio. It's, I'll, I'll give you four R's so it's easy to remember. Read. So just read, choose a passage, um, the pass- the gospel for this coming Sunday or the first reading, um, something that's manageable for you. So just read through the passage and see what's happening in the story. Um, the second time, the second R is reflect or meditate. Mm. So really put yourself into the scene. Hear Christ speaking the words to you, or if it's Peter, here's Peter speaking the words to you. Picture where you would would have been while he was delivering that sermon. Um, And start to listen or look for a particular word or phrase that stands out to you. So we're going to read, we're going to reflect by meditating, um, then we're going to respond in prayer. So that word that stood out to you or that phrase that stood out to you, you're going to just talk to God about it and see what he might be trying to show you through his word. And then finally, the fourth one is I would say rest. So last week, I know Deacon Peter challenged us to spend five minutes of silence with the Lord, right? So that could be the time. Just taking all that you've gleaned from the word, um, having talked to God about it, what he's trying to to teach you or show you through his word, um, and just sit quietly with him and enjoy that time. So very easy way to pray with scripture, four parts, read, reflect, respond in prayer and just rest with the Lord. So this is something anybody can do. Um, I do a modified version of this even with my four and five-year-olds in our preschool program. So anybody can do this. That is very <laughs> consoling, Lori. Yeah. That's really good news. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. And they get it, the four-year-olds. That's good. Um, I had a four-year-old, we usually have a little prayer time mm-hmm. and we'll read a little bit of scripture. And one day one of them said to me, um, Ms. Power, I wanna read it. Now she can't read, but she picks up my Bible <laughs> And she opens it up to a page that looked like what we were reading. And she Uh said, Jesus is the light. If you're in darkness, God brings the light. I was like, she (laughs) got it. (laughs) So four-year-olds can have a relationship with God. We all can. So (laughs) absolutely. So easy way. So the challenge would be um, if you've never prayed with scripture before, take some time to do it using that method. It doesn't take a long time, maybe a few minutes. Um, if you have prayed with scripture or um, would like to be a little bit more of a witness, you can actually invite other people just like we did tonight to read it together and then share what stuck out to you. So two ways that you can really dive into scripture and also share your faith. Lori, thank you for that. I just, I really want to repeat that the fact that I hope you're looking at this right now and 
and realizing this is possible in your living room, this is possible at your parish center, this is possible with coworkers or friends. And I hope that we haven't said anything like overtly huge, big language. We're, we're sharing. We, we have some knowledge of this. And um, it's really at a level that all, all of us can do this. And we're, we want to really give you that uh, support to be able to do it well, wherever, whatever setting you want to do it in. Should we get the story then? Sure. Okay. So we're going to close, well, not quite close, but move in that direction with a, a story um, that I wanted to, that actually Deacon Peter said would be a good idea for me to tell um, when we we're talking about preparing for this. Um, and it's take you back to Venezuela. I was on a trip to see a lot of good friends of mine from Venezuela, um, the Batania group down there, uh, in 2014. Uh, now, I took six years of Spanish in high school, and I thought I, I, you know, I came out AP, Spanish 5. Senior year, I thought, oh, look how much I know, <laughs> you know. Nice. So I would go to people in Venezuela first year I went there, and then I realized very quickly I'd say something in Spanish. i go, oh, you know Spanish. And they would say something to me, and I didn't know Spanish anywhere near as well as I thought I did. It was very humbling. It was good because these things are good. It's got to, you know, yeah. you, you're, you'd be purified, right, of your of your pride. So it worked out for me. So I figured out, no, I don't, I'm not fluent, <laughs> but I know about half of what uh, can be said if someone's speaking in, in normal Spanish. But if they go fast, I, it's really hard for me to, to pick up on it. Um, so whenever someone's reflecting on something in Spanish, it's always better for me to have a translator there. We went to mass uh, at the cathedral in Caracas, one one uh, the capital, one um, one week, and the priest got up there and he gave a homily in Spanish. And obviously, there's no translator. I can't tell you how this happened. I understood every single word of it, almost virtually every single word. I understood exactly what he said. I, I didn't hear it in English. I mean, that was pretty cool what happened at Pentecost when they heard it. I didn't hear it in my own language. <laughs> but this priest got up there. He spoke with such fire. He's, he, he meant what he was saying. He was all in Moses and fighting to get the Israelites uh, out of Egypt and to the promised land. And then he likened that to the resurrection and to what true love is. And he kept saying, there's not, there's, love cannot be won without a fight, you know, to make that, mm. we've talked about a conviction, right? Yeah. To make that deep decision, even when you don't feel it, to really, you know, dig deep in your faith and, and do what you know is right from the Lord. He went on and on. It was like a 15-minute homily. I heard all of it. And I understood all of it. Wow. And that's not because of anything I did. That was purely, I believe, because this priest was on fire. This priest was an incredible preacher, and he cared about what he said. It was Father Juan Carlos down there. Uh, I remember his name. I, we, he, we knew him pretty well from our, our, our pilgrimages down there as a church. But what I'm trying to say with the story is that little miracles and big miracles, they do happen. Um, my, my conversion experience came through the miraculous, the supernatural. They do happen. What you read about in Pentecost, it does happen. Uh, and it can happen. And many saints, think about Padre Pio, 27,000 documented miracles in his life. I mean, it, it, those things do happen, yeah. right? Uh, it's amazing. Your faith, our faith, our Catholic faith is very real. It's very tangible. But it can, e it, it can become easy to get discouraged when you hear about these miracles. So the good part about these miracles, the thing to remember is that these miracles don't happen for people to be able to brag, to boast, mm -hmm. to show off. If a miracle happens and nothing good happens afterwards. No, nothing good in somebody's heart. The Holy Spirit doesn't get someone to change from their heart outward. Yeah. If that doesn't happen, then the miracle didn't come from God or it was faked, right? Um, and so the important thing to remember is that if just by watching this or just by reading scripture, if something good is going on in your heart, you're on the right track. Don't ever be discouraged because as real as our faith is and as real as these miracles are, they're only there to get you closer to Jesus. And there are many ways, miracles or no miracles, you can get much, much closer to the Lord um, through prayer, through Lectio Divina, as, uh, as Laurie mentioned, through the rosary. I mean, we can, all, we can go on and on. Mass, of course, the sacraments, confession. So these are all ways that you can do the most important thing, the, you know, and that's to get the Holy Spirit back into your heart, to give your life back to the Lord, to try very, very, you know, patiently to overcome sins, you know, little by little, without being discouraged. That's the most important thing. Um, and that's why miracles do happen. That's why uh, Pentecost happened. Mm. So, Thank you for that, Dan. The fruits of Pentecost. We're still living in them. Pretty cool.
Donna, do you have a, oh, you have another question for us. <laughs> well, actually, when Tyler <laughs> opened tonight was about who's your favorite preacher in the diocese. Uh -oh. <laughs> so there's a few comments in here, and some folks were willing to uh, talk about who, they're, who theirs were. So, so what are yours? Deacon Peter Gallagher. Not of true. course. That's <laughs> not true. No. So it was just a fun question, but there is some conversation there. I believe uh, Father Bartoloma was mentioned. Ooh. Ooh. Father Kevin Mohan was mentioned. So Bishop Sullivan is an excellent preacher. Too. Bishop so. Sullivan is, <laughs> and I'm not just saying that. No, I believe that. I agree with you. Very clear. I agree. Yeah. Bishop Sullivan told us drafts. He told us drafts. Draft. Preaching is important, and your love comes out in your preaching. So mm -hmm. I think we've in the seminary gotten that message which right. is, is your good. love comes out to your people yeah right and so at this point all of us you know in the age of coronavirus which we've all talked about are living through our virtual masses mm -hmm. you know and really um and we all miss going to mass and we all miss uh, receiving the eucharist but i know our priests miss us too yeah you know it's a sad time for them too so so we're gonna um close up this evening so what i would like to do is to thank Lori and Dan and Deacon Peter, this was a terrific night of discussion of the Acts of the Apostles. You're a great gift, you know, to come and share your witness and your reflections on the Acts of the Apostles. This is really important for us uh, because really in our uh, baptism comes the call to discipleship and to missionary discipleship, which means forming others for Christ. So this was a really great and wonderful, robust conversation around how we do that today here in the 21st century. Uh, and we can learn an awful lot from the apostles. Uh, and they really were up against it in the early days. We are too, but it's a little bit different. We're not being martyred. <laughs> so we get a chance to really truly be joyful while we were on, while we were on mission. I wanted to share with you too what's coming up for the rest of the week uh, this week in our retreat. So we have Faith and Family with Carrie Janice tomorrow night. Wednesday night, we have Young Church. And that is with Star Martinez and Jose Rodriguez. And those are our young adults in the church. And then on Thursday, we have another evening of Faith and Reason with Fathers Bartoloma and Rox. And we look forward to that, too. And it is just a, it's a beautiful Easter season. And I hope that all of us are able to find the early fruits in a period that is difficult uh, for us all in this age of coronavirus. But we are all together. And God ha works all things to the good. So I'm going to turn it over to Deacon Peter now for a final blessing for all of us on this night of retreat. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you in his love, that you may be made worthy of the calling you have received. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. <laughs>